All right, so we are back for our third speaker. So right now, um, just want to find out from all of you guys out there, how are you feeling right now? So we are on to the third session of the day. So it has been a marathon session, right? I know there's a lot of information, but a few things that I want to uh, let every one of us know, please also take out the pen and pencil. If you have any gold nuggets, please jot it down so that you may be able to process it better, right? So during the session, right, uh, we have been talking a, a lot about online presence, a lot about uh, how to engage uh, students uh, using tools and techniques that are technological based. So what if you don't have that uh, luxury, right? What if you only have WhatsApp in that way? Uh, you only have Telegram or in a way you do not have any of the devices, right? So our next speaker over here, Bernard Au, has actually been discussing with me for uh, the past few weeks. And we have been discussing about uh, initiatives that he and his organization, Pemimpin GSL. So he has told me that personally, he has been uh, running programs across 90 different other schools, which are teaching them on tools and techniques on how they can engage their students better, right? So um, I guess I want to put all the, the highlight on Bernard Ao, and I would just like to introduce Bernard Ao to every one of you out here. So give a warm like and love uh, emoji to Bernard Ao. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Jay, for having me here. OK, uh, awesome. I so I can see all the likes coming up, but it's all right. <laughs> all right. Okay. okay, so Bernard, for today's session, so uh, what will you be uh, sharing with us and what's the outcome of the session for today? Okay, so my topic is effective teaching strategies and navigating the new norm. And like you mentioned, I will share a little bit on uh, strategies on how to teach with little to uh, very little bandwidth. How do you engage students with WhatsApp? And also a little bit of um, strategies you can use in high bandwidth situations. So I believe because educators, we will probably have to know both because um, we probably have classes with mixed bandwidth, right? So we need to know these both techniques to engage them better. So, so before we start, I just want a context for all of the audiences here. Uh, could you yeah. tell us more uh, what Pemimpin GSL has been doing for the past three months and what uh, have you been uh, establishing uh, towards the, the few years? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Pemimpin GSL is a organization that gives two-year leadership training program for government school leaders. So uh, after the MCO started, what we have been doing is uh, a few main, two main things, I would say. So one is facilitating learning among school leaders. So where we get, uh, we will sometimes share strategies with them. And sometimes we'll also invite speakers to come and share strategies with them and facilitate learning communities among themselves. So that's one big part. And second part is we will also do a coaching course to support the school leaders in terms of um, brainstorming uh, on how to solve certain challenges they're facing right now. So these are the two main things we've been doing for the past three months. Uh, following the, so we base our approach on the Maslow hierarchy of needs, following, starting from the basic, right? The basic needs, uh, whether the students have the necessities during this season, moving towards the emotional needs, whether they feel safe to learn during this season, and lastly, towards uh, self-actualization, which is learning. All right. So yeah. I guess there you hear it. So I guess it will be a very interesting topic. I'm excited to learn more as well. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Bernard uh, to deliver his uh, key sharing session for today. All right. Up to you, Bernard. Okay. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, before I put on my slides, right, I just want to share a story that I heard from my friend lately. So he told me, this teacher friend told me, right, last time we went, when we were in class, when students ignore us or sleep in class, right, we can wake them up straight away. And if they want to bond in class, we can stop them, find them and bring them back to class. But right now, when we're teaching online, they can ignore our messages, ignore the homework and even leave the WhatsApp group. So he asked me, like, how are we supposed to engage students in online learning? He told the story to me with a lot of frustrations. So when I hear this from my friends, right, I also feel very suck it hearty for them. And I just want to say uh, to all the teachers out there, while still striving to prepare a meaningful lesson for your students, I truly respect you. And to all of you fellow respected educators, 
Right now, if very little students turn up to your session, please don't give up. Focus on the few that are coming because through you and only you, the students can have quality learning during this season. So today, I would like to share some strategies that I've seen work for some uh, school leaders, and I certainly hope that it would work for all of you here too. I think you guys can see the slides, right? Okay, so I think the main question that all of us have been asking is how to engage students in online learning. All of us want to know uh, the answer to this, right? So just want to put it out there that I don't have a magic bullet or solution to, to engage all of them, but I hope these strategies will engage them a little bit better after this. So I've summarized it into three main points. Point number one is clear communication. We need to be very clear with our instructions, outcome, and expectations on them, be it our deadlines, some mode of homework, submission. This is important because if students don't understand something, they will very likely to be disengaged. And if they are confused, they will ask a lot of questions in the WhatsApp groups. So then we don't want that to happen. So clear communication is the first key. The second key is strong routines. So based on the research that I've read lately, right? When students were asked what are the main challenges of online learning, it's the lack of consistent learning structure. So, so things like taking attendance, lesson objectives, classroom norms, no matter what routines you choose for your class, be consistent in them. Because once students get used to it, they'll be more comfortable opening up to you in class and answering questions. So a certain level of predictability helps they would, have, they would like to have this consistent learning structure because it would be easier for them to follow. The third key is fun learning. I realize when it comes to online teaching, a lot of teachers are too focused on the teaching and learning, but they forgot to have fun. So we know that when students are not having fun, they, it's not so easy to engage them. So now that UPSR and PT3, these major exams are canceled, I think it's the best time to be creative and fun with our teaching. So try out the things that you normally don't get to try out right now to engage your students. So this is important because with students' attention span getting shorter, we need to continuously find ways to engage them to get their focus. So these are the three big ideas. And later, I will try to demonstrate to you how it will look like in a WhatsApp lesson and also in a slightly high bandwidth lesson in Google Meet Google Classroom. So yeah, like I said, how can we incorporate these few points mentioned above into our lessons? So here are two things that I'll demonstrate later. The first one is online teaching in a low bandwidth situation. And the second one is online teaching in a high bandwidth situation. So before we even talk about the different strategies uh, in both of these contexts, it's important that you know which category of bandwidth your students belong in. So throughout this session, uh, it's important that you only pick those strategies to fit in your scenario. So now the question is, how much bandwidth do our students have? So this is something that I've uh, take, uh, took from Teach from Malaysia uh, and Bain's microsite. It's uh, publicly available information and they're very good content. So feel free to check them out. So the question is, how much bandwidth do our students have? Right? So there are four levels here, as you can see zero bandwidth, low, medium, and high bandwidth. So zero bandwidth means um, they don't have access to any device at all. So they don't have Wi-Fi and data. Low bandwidth means they have a smartphone, but often at the times they have to share. And this is happening in, in a lot of our schools. They have to share their devices with, with their siblings. Medium bandwidth means they have smartphones, but they don't have laptops or tablets. They have data, but it's not enough for them to do video calls. Lastly, high bandwidth. This, uh, is, this talks about the students that have smartphones, laptops, and tablets, 
they also have steady Wi-Fi and data connection to do video calls. So identifying which, which uh, scenario do you fall under first, and then think about strategies uh, later. So today I will highlight two scenarios here, which is low and high bandwidth. So I will use, so like I said just now, low bandwidth is where we teach using apps like WhatsApp and Telegram and Padlet, and high bandwidth is with a lot more other apps. So before I jump into the strategies, here are some platforms that uh, will be suitable for high bandwidth, mid and low bandwidth. So high bandwidth um, tools are like Google Classroom, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and more. Mid bandwidth is like uh, are tools like you can use tools like Google Form, Quizzes, Book Widgets, Padlet, and so on. And lastly, low bandwidth it's WhatsApp and Telegram. And these two apps are you can choose these apps depending on uh, number one, the bandwidth that the students belong in, and number two, which one are they more comfortable with. So I realize a lot of students are more comfortable with WhatsApp rather than Telegram, so you might want to choose WhatsApp instead. So I believe that online learning can still follow our core teaching principles. So that means although the platform has changed from face-to-face -to, -face to online, but the approach remains the same. So the upcoming parts of the presentation, I will follow one of our core teaching principles, which is the five-step lesson plan. I will explain this uh, briefly because I know uh, part of the audience might not be teachers and they might not know this, so I'll just go through briefly. So firstly, it's induction. Teacher will start the lesson, they will use ways to attract students' interest and attention. Number two is presentation. Teachers will demonstrate uh, and, to sh and show students how to achieve lesson objective. Number three is giving students opportunity to practice, be it on their own or be it with their peers. Number four, production, is where students are given independent work time. Without assistance, they will do their own work. Lastly is closing, where students will, uh, sorry, where teachers will end and recap. The, uh, recap the lesson and probably end with a reflection. So later, I will uh, share my teaching strategies according to this five-step lesson plan. Yeah, so these are the tools that I'll be using for low bandwidth and high bandwidth. Right now, I will start with uh, the low bandwidth first. So the first three steps I'll be demonstrating will be what I call uh, what we call the synchronous learning. So it means we have the expectation that students are going to be online at the same time, joining the WhatsApp or Google Meet lesson. And the final two steps are done asynchronously, meaning uh, it's not happening live. It happens after the class to when the students are free, they do their own work. So synchronous and asynchronous. All right, so, okay, let me just take a sip of water. All right, let's go to low bandwidth teaching strategies, right? So for induction, uh, under, under fun learning, I think I want to re recommend this step, which is to design text-based energizers to attract students to the topic of the day. So we can allow them to use emoji to in indicate their emotions, for example. Uh, so here's an example that I did uh, with a sample class, right? So while taking attendance, I ask them to put down their names and pick an emoticon that represents their feelings. So if the students are feeling great, then, then it's great, right? Tell them welcome to class. And if they are not feeling so great, uh, you can tell them, uh, do you, maybe we can talk about it after class and see whether is there anything that teacher can help you out with. So this gives an opportunity for everyone to understand each other's situation in class and also give them opportunity to bond with each other. And here's an, a variation of what you can do. If you want to push, push it, one, uh, bring it one step further, you can ask them to choose an emotion and then explain why are they feeling that way. So for instance, if let's just say they pick number 10, they say they are surprised and you can ask them why do you feel surprised today? So this will also help you to get to know the students better and understand them. So second part of induction, uh, I want to encourage uh, 
teachers to do this, to encourage students to participate actively with text messages. So for example, we can uh, norm the use of emoji for certain purposes. For instance, use emoji to indicate the level of understanding and readiness. As you can see in the example on the right here, they can do thumbs up to show that they understand and thumbs down if they don't. And if they want to ask questions, instead of ask, instead of like, allowing them to type questions straight away, maybe you can ask them to raise up their hand uh, so that you wouldn't interrupt the flow of the class. And here's another example, but you can put up a speech bubble and tell them that when you see a speech bubble means I want you to answer this question. So with all these norms in place, right, it will help you to minimize distractions in the group chat. And obviously this one, uh, it might be tough at the beginning, but after you norm it often, it will be very, it will be seamless like, for them to follow. And another step that I want to recommend is state objective of the lesson in one text message, uh, just like what I've did here on the side. So here I'm teaching a maths lesson on teaching students how to do addition. So if um, there are some students that enter a little bit late, they can still scroll up the message to find this one to know exactly what the teacher is teaching for the day. So that's it for the first step, induction. So right now I'll move on to the second step of the five step present plan, which is presentation. In one step, um, what we can do is we can state the simple steps to achieve the lesson objective in one text message. So it's again, it's easier for students to look for the instructions if they forgot. And so here's an example of how to do addition in BM. And in the situation where let's say they have a little bit more data, I would recommend that uh, you can show them a video on how to do addition or even record yourself teaching because um, they definitely prefer video over text. But if this is not allowed, then you can just go, I mean, if a situation doesn't allow you to do video, then text uh, would work as well. And step two is to prepare and show a sample end product of the lesson uh, using text. So for instance, I want to do addition and I want to make sure my students know exactly the steps to do it. So you can list it up clearly so that it's very easy for them to follow. And the third step is just like to set adequate time for students to internalize, especially if it's a new topic. So just like teaching in class, right, face to face, um, students will need time to internalize whatever they've learned. So it's the same with online learning. You can tell them that, okay, so I finished my presentation. I will give everyone one to two minutes to digest what you just learned and ask any clarifying questions. And then you can keep quiet for two minutes. And if they didn't answer, you can proactively ask them okay, if whether they understand or not using the thumbs up method. So here's an example that I've, uh, I've done to ask students whether they understand whatever teacher is teaching or not. So now to, towards the third step of the lesson plan out of the five step right, is practice. So to, we need to pre-plan pairing and grouping of students, ideally catering to their needs and personalities. So we know that some students, right, they open up easier to their friends and this will help them to have the discussion better. So consider grouping them together in this situation uh, so that you can focus your energy on other students that needs a bit more help. And also for this pair and group work to work, it'll be easier if you have group leaders that you can rely on so that then you can empower them and tell them exactly what they need to do before the class so that the class can happen seamlessly. There's another, uh, so besides group discussions, there's another uh, thing that, that we can do here is to have a group discussion on Padlet. So Padlet is a tool that uh, looks a bit like a virtual, white, virtual board where students can just paste all their answers on it. And later I'll show you how it looks like in the next slide. So if you want to do whatever task we give, right? Remember clear, communica clear communication is very important. So state the task output expected and time given in very, very simple language. 
And here's an example on how uh, the instructions will look like. All right. So the task here is to ask the students to copy down the questions, do it in the exercise book, take a picture, and then upload to Padlet. So in the next slide, I'll show you how it looks like. So this picture is how the outcome will look like with all the students' answers uh, pasted side by side. And then this is where the teacher can come in and give feedback to the students whether question one, two, three is correct. And you can also empower some group leaders to give feedback to their peers. Yep, so I think covered these two points. So moving on to the fourth step of the lesson plan, which is production. This is where we plan for independent work that clearly demonstrates students' understanding via text, right? So here's an, so again, clear communication, similar, uh, similar concept with the previous one. State the task, output expected, time given, and submission method in simple steps. So here's an example of the text on how to inform them on this. So you can tell them, okay, this is the questions. Finish it by 22nd June, 10 p.m. and hand in via WhatsApp to, to the teacher personally. And I, will, I also like to recommend teachers to use uh, Google Form. I think Google Form is, uh, right now they have the auto marking uh, system and I think it's brilliant. So after students finish the Google Form, they will know their marks straight away and teachers will get a copy too. So in that sense, it's very easy for teachers to keep track of the students' uh, students' homework. Yeah, so really recommend this. To, please check it out if you haven't done it yet. So the final step is closing. Uh, so this is where we can provide a simple checklist for students to self-assess if they have achieved the learning objective. So if you give these questions right, students will more likely follow you be able to follow your instructions well and complete the task. So here's some questions for them to reflect uh, on whether they have done the addition correctly. The next step is that remember to tell the students how to reach out to you if they need help. Uh, it can be on direct text messages or Padlet, uh, whatever platform you prefer, but you need to let them know because sometimes students might be a little bit shy to reach out to us, especially the ones that are a little bit younger. All right, so before I end, before I end this uh, on WhatsApp lesson, right? If one of students didn't turn off class, so here's one pro tip. The pro tip is to compile all the instructions that you have sent in the class just now, compile into one long message so that if students miss the class, they can come back and just refer to this long message. They can start it and refer back to it whenever they are available to do their homework. So yeah, so that's the first scenario that I just shared uh, with regards to how to teach and it's some strategies to teach uh, in a low bandwidth situation. And right now, I will move on to high bandwidth situation where we will uh, talk about using other tools like Google Meet and Google Classroom. So again, this is with the expectation that all students can gather and join a virtual class at the same time. So in high bandwidth situation, right, there's a lot more things you can do. And if you can, if you, if students have the bandwidth, I really recommend that you go high bandwidth instead of doing uh, WhatsApp teaching, because I tried it myself, WhatsApp teaching, uh, it's definitely a lot more uh, difficult compared to in a high bandwidth situation. But that's uh, if we have the luxury, uh, then we go for high bandwidth. Uh. So the same, so for induction for the high bandwidth teaching, online teaching, it's the same concept, right? Design some energizers to attract students to the topic of the day. So the first tool that I wanna recommend is uh, do digital storytelling. And one tool that allows you to do that is storyboard that. So I'm not too sure whether you can see the picture clearly, but basically this is a story that a student created on how's the situation like when uh, 
he went out for a walk during MCO. So in this first picture, he went out to the, the shops and it's closed. The second, he went to the stadium and there's no one there. And the third and fourth picture is someone asked whether we can have a pool party and say no, because right now it's uh, the MCO, right? So this is, this is one way for us to allow students to express themselves and also for educators like us to understand what the students are facing and thinking while they're at home. So this creates a lot of opportunity for students to bond with each other. So the second is we can do short online games uh, like virtual scavenger hunt. So uh, what I did with uh, some of my school leaders lately is um, we'll ask everyone to turn on the video, uh, the webcam, as well as unmute their mic. And if I say a certain item, they'll need to grab the item and shout out their name. Whoever shouts out their name first will win. So here's an example I did uh, with watch. So I just took my watch and shouted my name. Whoever is the fastest will win the game. So this, uh, I think, I think yeah, this game will work for any age group because it's very uh, instant, fun, and interactive. The third one is uh, while students are coming in, you can play songs and play videos that are trending lately uh, to help to relate to the students a little bit more. Like. So for instance, if you see a very cute, if you like cats and you really like, if you like cats and you see a very cute cat video, you can share it with the students at the beginning just to humanize yourself and connect with the students before class. So that's the first point. Design energizers to attract students in the topic of the day. So this falls under uh, the category of fun learning. The second is um, just like physical classroom, right? I think it's very important to have virtual or online classroom norms as well, norms as well. So give them very clear expectations on what you expect. So here is uh, some of, one example that we did with our, our, our school leaders when we carry out a session, is that we will tell them our expectations at the beginning of the lesson. That, okay, if you are, if you're not speaking, please uh, mute yourself and do not take too, too much time in sharing so that everyone has a chance to share, uh, be ready to listen to new ideas, and lastly, make sure you're comfortable and make sure you're ready to uh, mute the mic and turn on the camera whenever you are asked to answer questions. And similar concept to what we talked about in WhatsApp just now, uh, we can norm the use of icons for certain purposes. So for instance, this emoji, uh, this icon with a paper and pen. When we show this icon, means we want the uh, we want our students to write down their answers on the paper and show on video. And the one on the right is a speech bubble. So when they see this speech bubble, means we want them to answer the questions in the chat box uh, while we are having our Google Meet meetings. And there are a lot more tool, a lot more icons that you can. Uh, uh, you can find and you use it, but here's just two examples for you. And again, whatever norms that we have set, repeat and enforce this of, often to mold the online classroom culture. So it will definitely take time to create this culture, but it will definitely be worth it. And lastly, all this will help minimize discussions in the group chat. So here's the first step uh, of the five step lesson plan. Right now, I'll move on to the second which is uh, presentation. So obvious, obviously we teachers can either present real time or show pre-recorded content. And uh, I've heard from students that they prefer pre-recorded videos because they are able to re-watch the video after class. So if let's say there's only one part that they don't understand, they don't have to ask the teacher. They just have to look, look back at the video for that specific part. And yeah, and the second is the same rule as mentioned in WhatsApp class just now. Uh, we need to proactively assess the student's understanding by getting a thumbs up or getting them to type their responses in the chat box. So now towards the third step of the five-step lesson plan, which is practice. 
Um, so same approach applies. Pre-plan the pairing and grouping, ideally catering to their needs and personalities. So in high bandwidth uh, situation, obviously we can do uh, Zoom calls, Google Meet calls, or WhatsApp calls like this. But we definitely recommend a uh, Zoom platform because it allows us to do breakouts, breakout rooms seamlessly. And you can, and once the once you create the breakout rooms, it's easy for you to hop in and out the breakout rooms. And you can also uh, close the breakout room after a certain time is over. So with other apps, such function is not available yet. So I definitely recommend using Zoom if you were to do breakout rooms. And yeah, like I said just now, uh, you can either supervise, uh, supervise the group discussions, like joining in and out of the group discussions, or you can empower some of your student leaders to lead and facilitate the session. So towards the fourth step of the five-step lesson plan, production. I think that, uh, this is the time where we can plan for creative and independent work that clearly demonstrates students' understanding. And I think this is an opportunity for us to do activities that normally is very difficult for us to do in schools. So we can do project-based learning at home. Uh, for example, I really like the science experiment that I saw one teacher did online, where this teacher, he recorded uh, steps on how to do food preservation on a YouTube video. And he sent this video to the students. So students have to follow the exact step the teacher has shown to do food preservation. And as you can see here, they have, this student has uh, managed to do three ways of uh, food preservation while they're at home. So I can imagine this would be very difficult to do in schools because in schools you need like so many uh, need a huge amount of uh, resources, but at home it might be easier for students to find these things uh, in their own home. So, and number two is state the task. Uh, this is clear communication again. State the task, output expected, time given, and submission methods in clearly, uh, easily understandable steps. Lastly, for closing, uh, we can provide self checklists for students to assess themselves, like what we did in WhatsApp. But here I want to show an example on how a teacher can provide reflective questions for students to reflect on their learning. So this teacher used uh, Google Classroom to put, type down uh, the reflection, reflective questions, and students will just need to uh, answer when they are free. So yeah, this is uh, another way that you can do to close up a lesson in a high bandwidth situation. And again, similar to uh, WhatsApp lesson, what if students didn't turn up for class? So what I see one teacher did was he com compiled all the uh, resources into a Google Doc as well. Then they can just refer to this document to click on the links to watch the videos and to do their work as requested. So yeah, uh, uh, just now I managed to demonstrate some teaching strategies in low and high bandwidth situation. And before I end my sharing, I want to share a video with you. This video uh, is this video talks about a lot of creative things that teachers have done during this MCO to engage with the students. So enjoy the video. I'll ask. Uh, Jay, can you please? About teachers. Not only are they not giving up, but many of them are actually stepping up their game to help meet these new challenges. Welcome to my African savannah. Mrs. Andrea Anderson doesn't normally dress up in a lion costume and stand in front of a green screen, but very little is normal these days. The math teacher at Bronx Theater School spicing up his online lessons with impersonations. And his numbers go down, go down. Post below! This Clinton High School teacher is taking her lesson plans to her students' TikTok, starting with the basic equations. Hello. We're twins. Adding a little music. An eighth grade teacher. But good educators know that some things just can't be transmitted through a screen. 
When the coronavirus put the brakes on the school year, Pat Nagel came up with an idea. He hops on his bike and pops in for a pop quiz. I'm here for your final pop exam. Most days, Patrick Murtaugh can be found teaching health and phys ed inside Regal Road Public School. These days, he can be found taking to his bike and visiting students in front of their houses for a social distance dance party. The senior class at Wiley High in Texas can't go to school, but Principal Verdi Montgomery quickly realized he could go to them. Montgomery hit the road in over 12 days, visited every senior, 612 of them from six feet away. He gave each a candy bar, telling them one day we'll look back at this and snicker. I delivered that joke nearly 600 times, so it's pretty lame. Oh, man. This is the most heartwarming story I've ever seen about a grown man handing candy out to underage. All right, hope you enjoyed the video. I personally really liked it. I thought all the features are really cute. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So there was a very comprehensive uh, sharing session by Bernard. So if you enjoy Bernard's presentation and if you find it helpful, please comment down there, right? Comment there, I like it, I like it, right? So uh, Bernard has shared uh, with a lot of teachers out there that have actually told me personally, Jay, I do not have uh, Google Meet, right? I have it, but my, my students do not have access to it, right? Or they do not even have the phone or devices to use it. I guess what you're showing over here allows a lot of teachers uh, to, to utilize uh, simple apps like WhatsApp, right? Even WhatsApp, you can do a lot of wonders by using just WhatsApp by itself, right? Yes. So, uh, Bernard, could you just uh, tell us more about uh, the schools that you have been working with and what are the key challenges that you have found out to be the most prevalent in terms of uh, communication with students? If you can share some of it with us. All right. So um, I think uh, there's a few things, right? Number one, as mentioned just now, is the lack of devices. So a lot of students, they have shared devices. Uh, and especially now that a lot of parents are working, uh, students don't have the the device access to the class. So that's one, lack of, uh, lack of devices. Number two is um, students' interest is also getting lesser after a while, especially when there is no, I mean, the online learning structure is not very structured. So ever since MCO started, I've heard from school leaders that the interest has dropped uh, week after week. Um, that's because uh, a lot of them are also more inclined to think about doing other things like, oh, I should work for and earn money for the family. And the last bit is communication breakdown happens when some students don't understand the mode of the language of instruction. So for instance, uh, some students don't, their BM is not very well. And in schools, right, uh, it's already difficult for them to explain in person on the instructions. But right now in message platform, it's, mo it's even more difficult. Yeah, so these are three big points. Okay. And yep. And lastly yeah. is we know that uh, dropouts might happen because uh, like I mentioned just now, they are, uh, they, are, they are after not learning for a while, right? They are thinking about other things like they want to work for the family. So I think right now it's very important that school leaders um, and school teachers reach out, try their best to reach out uh, out of class to these students that are not turning up and hopefully we can get them back to school again. Okay. So speaking of communication devices, right? I guess over communicating and having different devices or vehicles to communicate with students is very important as well, right? So speaking of such, so for all of you that are tuning in right now, if you are not already in the Telegram group, right? Please go and like or join the Telegram group in the link, right? Because all of the session, before we start the session, we will share the link over there so you are easily accessible to all of this, the live session so you don't miss up in all of the session. So these are one of the examples that even before the session, we would have another communication device that will allow them to easily access it. So, so there you go, yeah. So if you have any questions for Bernard, please uh, post it in the comment, then hopefully Bernard will be able to address it to uh, you guys out there. So one question from JJ, I think. So she would like to find out, would like to know where are you currently teaching? Oh, okay. So um, I actually was a teacher uh, in Johor Bahru, SNK Taman Daya Dua in Johor. So I thought 
uh, there for two years under the Teach for Malaysia program. So right now, I'm actually uh, not a teacher anymore. I'm working in an NGO called the Mimbin GSL, where we provide uh, support to school leaders. Yeah, so uh, the, then, uh, yeah, I'm based in KL now, not in Johor. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next question over here. Thanks, Bernard. Delivery of lessons you shared is good. I just want to know how do you assess learning and give them grades? So in, in other words, how do you... Um, how do you grade them, right? How do you find right. out uh, whether if they are performing well, uh, how do you let them know on that? Right, so how do we assess learning, right? Um, so there are two ways, in, especially in the low bandwidth situation. So one is um, we can ask students to, after they answer the questions, they can WhatsApp the, uh, WhatsApp the answer to us and we can grade them and send them back like, to give them feedback. And number two, uh, we can use tools like Google Form to uh, capture their capture their scores and their learning lah. yeah so these are the two tools that we will be using right now okay so also to add on to that question just want to find out from bernard uh, do you give them exercises as well and do you mark the papers just like what you did in normal classroom or is it uh, just like what you just mentioned that you yeah. you just uh, provide them with uh, marks through whatsapp for mm -hmm. low bandwidth of course yeah yeah uh, so just to clarify again, right? Uh, I'm currently I don't currently teach in a classroom, but this is what I've seen uh, some school leaders have done, uh, some teachers have done as well. So uh, number one is we uh, after they finish the lesson, they can take a picture of whatever they have done, and then I can grade it through a picture and send it back to them. And number two, they can also do self assess self assessment like what I mentioned just now. We give them a self checklist for them to assess how well they did in this lesson. And lastly, in, in a class where let's just say you have students that are uh, empowered, you can do peer-to-peer -peer evaluation uh, for them to know how well they did as well. Okay, so, so in a way they can self-assess themselves too. So we ask them how, how good do you think or how well yep. do you think you did in yep. this exercise? Right? Yes, and we can give them some reflective questions. Okay, very yeah. good. So I, I hope I'm learning some points over here as well. So a uh, question from Noor Haslinda. How do you hold the kids or students' attention during online session? Any suggestion? Uh, three tips. How do you hold a, a kids or students' attention? <laughs> so I think uh, basically this was what I'm trying to answer just now through my presentation, right? So three things. Clear communication, uh, be it Clear, clear instructions. So clear communication. Um, let me just pull out my slides again. So clear communication, right? Step-by-step -step instructions to complete tasks. You can show that. And show, if possible, show them a clear outcome and how it should look like. And number two is strong routines. So whatever routines that we do, we need to enforce it over and over again so that uh, students, with a bit of predictability, students feel comfortable learning with you. So, uh, like I mentioned just now in the research that I read lately, when students have inconsistent learning structure, they get disengaged very easily. So number two is definitely strong routines. Uh, so number three, and I think this is probably the most important one to engage them, is fun learning. So do a bit of games with them, have a little breaks, and do, do gamification of lessons, like what I mentioned. Uh, just now, you can play little games like virtual scavenger hunt. So whoever wins first, maybe you can give them a ECG or a price. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question, Chegu or Haslinda. Yeah, so so Chegu Haslinda also to add on, there are actually many, many different ways on how you hold uh, students' attendance attention during online classes. So for example, uh, we shared in the other session that uh, for one of my exp experiments, right, we tried out whether if we could sustain the attention of the students on online lessons for up to three hours. So maybe I can share with you two methods on how I actually did it. One of it, Bernard did it uh, during the first uh, the first few sentences when he came about. Do you remember what he did? So he did a story sharing session, right? He shared a story. So immediately a story will be able to get a person's attention. Uh, and there are many ways on how you can tell a story, right? Yep. And the second way on how I usually do it is uh, what I call a method of uh, sandwiching. Sandwiching means that, okay, from a context of the brain, right? There are many different parts of the brain on how you perceive uh, information and how you process. So number one is that there is the input whereby to, to make it simple, 
the brain will input data. That means you teach oh. and then I absorb the information, right? But however, when that part of a uh, brain is being used for more than 20 minutes, right? That part of the brain starts to get lethargic, right? Starts to get tired. So what you do is that you have to switch to the other part of the brain, which is the output. So like what Bernard has mentioned, you can do something like a games, right? Or sharing session, right? And then you yep. get the output from there. And then after that, then probably you might trigger the other parts of the brain whereby you give them reward, right? Reward, you play songs or you play some games and then they get some reward points and things like that. And then you go back again to the input. So it's like mm -hmm. a sandwich between different components of the brain, right? But in a nutshell, uh, it, it's good that if you are able to do some uh, research on how the brain actually functions to get information and how to prolong their attention via the sandwich method. Right, so a little bit wow. from there. Thank you. I, I also learning a lot from you now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, so for for my side, I managed to do it for three hours. Three hours. Wow. Yeah. And the only reason that they have to go off is because they have to go washroom. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. So Thank yeah. So I agree. Giving clear instruction, engaging, uh, fun activities for primary pupils during online sessions. Yeah. So another thing about gamification also we cannot overdo it, right? So if we mm -hmm. keep playing the same game, right, it triggers the same part of the brain for more than 20 minutes, eventually they get tired anyway. So, so I guess mm -hmm. switching around is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, Great. so, uh, okay, one, one user over here, I did the virtual uh -huh. scavenger hunt with my students and it worked, they loved it, thanks. Interesting sharing from Bernard, wow, okay. Thank you, thumbs up for you. Okay. Good job, Chegu. All right, so uh, any other questions that you can post in? Uh, so we, I, I think Bernard has a lot of different techniques and uh, very different activities that up his sleeve that he can share to us, right? So uh, if any, any question, please post down there. So another question, to engage kids, I learned that can do finger applause, Mentimeter, Queasy. Ah, Mentimeter ah. is nice, yes. So I think Mentimeter is like a word cloud thing, right? Where students can key in a lot of words. So for instance, ask what are you feeling right now? And then right. if uh, you see the word, the word that's biggest would be the word that students uh, are voicing out the most. I think it's a very good way to gauge the students, the emotions in the virtual classroom. Yep. Right. Okay. And uh, okay, uh, for, for those of uh, the teachers that are watching right now, we seem to be adding in a lot of different softwares, applications like Quizzes, Mentimeter, right? But don't worry because uh, during the another two day session or three day session, there are a lot of speakers out there that has a full YouTube channel that they have posted in their YouTube channel on all of these softwares out there. So, so please uh, continue on the, the lessons. We'll be sharing with you all of this platform that has all of these tools laid out in very clear instructional manner on how you can use all this software. Right, so this platform is for us to share all of this information, like what Bernard just did over here. Okay, so cool. uh, one question over here: Students in one class may be in low and high bandwidth. How are we going to do classes in cases like this, such as a way that we can lessen also the stress of teachers? Yeah, I, I guess it's a very prevalent uh, uh, challenge that teachers are experiencing. A lot of the students have high bandwidth, so they can progress very fast in their class. But what about then there's a mixture of four or five of them that does not have internet access or they have very low bandwidth access. So how do you balance the, uh, the classroom learning so that everyone progresses at the same time so no one gets left behind? Mm -hmm. I think whenever the um, teacher mentioned uh, the stress of the teachers, right? I will uh, remind them of their of managing their expectations and locus of control. So especially uh, with, so if you, if you think that you want to reach to all of your students and all of them can do low bandwidth classes, right? Then maybe what you can do is you do a low bandwidth class uh, often and at, so that you can reach out to everyone. And at times to engage, to engage students more, you can do online lessons when you feel more comfortable. So I don't think we should, uh, don't feel if you are very feeling very tired and stressed don't feel obliged to do both every day because i think that's very tiring so what you can do is you take a step back and do low bandwidth first gain back uh uh man manage manage yourself well first and when you can you can do both low and high bandwidth yeah 
Right. Uh, also, I, personal question for me, right? If uh, there's a mixture of all of these students, how do you mm -hmm. maintain the progression? So do you, uh, in a way, customize it in a way that high bandwidth, then you teach more lessons than low bandwidth, uh, lesser lessons, or do you balance it all together? Uh, it's just a personal question of mine. I think ideally we, we should uh, definitely do differentiation, but if in the case that if it's difficult for you, what I've seen some teachers do is that they will collaborate across the form, right? So for instance, it's form two class. The form two class, uh, the one teacher would do online lessons for the high bandwidth students. And then all the class, all, all the students from other classes can join their teacher's lessons as well. So in that sense, they can also uh, learn through the high bandwidth method. And you can have another teacher that creates, for example, WhatsApp lessons and Google Forms that caters to the low bandwidth uh, students. And these forms, right, you can also share with all the other classes, just that in the end, uh, when you do the data analysis, you have to extract it separately. But I think that's a very good way to collaborate within your own school uh, and leverage on your resources. Okay. So the key here is sharing, working together yes. with other teachers as well. So you don't yeah. work too much on yeah. creating yeah. lessons plans and things like that. Okay, wow, it. a lot of questions for, for this session, yeah? Okay, one Facebook user actually asked, we're talking about examination, right? So that students cannot copy answers. So we talk about sharing the answer on WhatsApp. So question is, how do you ensure that students do not copy off the internet and submit their answer as wow. their own? Wikipedia, right? <laughs> So do you wow. monitor them taking the okay. exams? Yeah, very good question. I, I believe a lot of good people question. Are. Ah, ah I've, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for this yet. I think this is something that is very difficult to avoid now. But if I have the answer, I will pass it. I will answer it in a while. Hmm. Right. All right. Okay. I think one, maybe what you can do is you can ask open-ended questions when, where it's more difficult for them to copy. So um, I think if you ask like close-ended questions, like uh, what is the definition of a word, I think that's very easy to copy. But if you ask open-ended questions, probably that's a little bit more. But yeah, if I found a better answer, I will definitely answer this later. I see. So I guess uh, if you want to, for, for me, what, what I've seen from there is that if you require them to have separate um, answers, right? So usually what I would do is that I would request them to show up their work. So I guess mm -hmm. there's no way to, uh, to really control them whether if they go yeah. online and get the answer. So at least uh, if I actually request them to show their work, right, from I A to, to Z or to video right. record them explaining the answer, at least I know they're learning something, right? Yeah. Right. Very smart. Yeah. You, so you, okay. So there's not, no easy way out for them. Okay. I like that. And then uh, there was one uh, teaser that we put out from Dr. Tazli. He, he actually shared with us a flip assessment method, which means that uh, the questions that you create, right, you ask the students to create their own questions. In other words, let's say if there's a topic, right, on uh, let's say uh, multiplication, right? So in order for us to require them to understand this topic, if you were to ask them specific questions, they can go online and search, right? But however, if you ask them to design the question themselves, right? So design a question based on this topic. So they can't plagiarize it from anywhere. So they have to right. use their, their own method and their own thinking, their own research to come up with a question together with the answer. So wow. yeah, there you go. Wow, this is a very high level. Wow, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've been learning a lot from a lot of the speakers out there as well. Nice. Yeah. All right. So uh, next up, I guess, uh, follow up from my previous question. Okay, I guess this is a similar part, right? Where we assess unprotected word, won't there be a question of educational integrity? So yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess this leads back to the same question whereby how do you uh, prevent plagiarism and uh, copy among students? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, uh, Bernard, can you share the slides you use for your presentation? Thanks in of advance. Course. Of course. So okay. how should I share that? Just let me know. Yeah. Okay. So so what we can do is that uh, for Bernard's uh, slide, uh, do Bernard will be sharing with us the, the PDF copy. So remember, all of the lessons after the live session, we will be placing it under units for every single speaker. So units, just think of it as like a folder where we'll put Bernard's video as well as any materials that Bernard will be sharing with us, right? So the PDF file 
will be in the unit after the session. Okay, but please give us some time to compile all of this. Lah. Yeah, sure. all right. So thank you for that question. Uh, students must be able to synthesize the theory parts along the info they got from the internet in answering the question. Every student has different thought process and the answer will vary. Yes, uh, exactly, uh, exactly just that there are like uh, many different ways on answering the same question, right? Okay, any other questions from Bernard? Okay, because uh, Bernard, uh, in, in which case, right, I guess we have uh, spoken about uh, the initiative that Pemimpin GSL is currently working on. So uh, maybe you can share with all of us over here on the uh, coming up initiatives, right? In coming, going back into school, the transition back into school. Are there yep. any initiatives out there from uh, your organization and your team that will assist the transition back into school? What will it be like since online learning uh, has been prevalent? A lot of uh, kids are starting, a lot of them might be left behind in some of the syllabus. They might have to catch up yep. on the syllabus. Are there any solutions on towards that? Uh, if you can share your thoughts. Right. So, uh, okay, let me just organize my thoughts first, right? So I think um, with regards to school opening, um, we, are, we are thinking about a few things, right? The SOP, for the following of SOP part, uh, actually we believe that school leaders and teachers are very good at that and they will be able to set up the parameters according to what the education ministry wants. But currently, what we are thinking of is two things. One is the um, knowing how to, uh, the, the, how do I say this? In, trauma-informed practices and how to ma manage the emotions of the students when we go, when we go back. And there are some students are still at home that, so right now only form five is coming back, right? Form five, form six, but a lot of students are still at home. Then how can we help to man teach teachers some skills on how to manage these skills better? So that's one area that we're looking at. And uh, second area we, that we talked about is also the Kachichiran Plaja. So a lot of students might have skipped class for a long time. And these students are the ones that we need to reach out uh, to first. So what we can do is to ask the school leaders and teachers to find out from the past three months attendance list on which group are the ones that have missed out the most. So maybe we can give more attention towards this group of students as compared to the other ones who have followed uh, the teaching and learning for the past few months. Yeah. And lastly, we are also doing um, coaching calls with the school leaders. So from mm -hmm. time to time, we will call them and ask them, okay, how's things going on in school? Do you need uh, a brainstorming partner? And at times, if we find that a few schools are facing the same situation, we will help to facilitate uh, that discussion and form a little PLC for them to think of solutions that could help both schools together. Right. Okay. So a, a lot of initiative that is uh, been done by your organization. Uh, really thankful for organizations like yours that are helping teachers out there. Right. Okay. So uh, one question over here, I guess uh, because this is the lunch time, because I know there will be a lot of questions for this session, so that's why we put it during this lunch time so we can <laughs> entertain more questions. So I guess this is a very good question. Students in one class may be in low and high bandwidth. So how are we going to do the classes in cases like this, such in a way that we can also lessen the stress of teachers? Yeah, I guess teachers are, we understand that a lot of them are facing a lot of stress, coming up with syllabus, uh, marking the uh, homeworks and then still having to entertain uh, some form of uh, backlash from students and here and forth. So how do we do this to lessen the stress of teachers in this case? Right. Yeah, I believe we answered this question already just now, right? Like, uh, so then what I talked about was, uh, so number one, locus of control. So in a situation where teachers feel stress, right? I think it's okay to take a step back and do the low bandwidth approach, which I think it's probably... Uh, less tiring, and then focus on your well-being first. So once your well-being is better, then you can at times do the high bandwidth and slowly uh, move towards catering to both low and high bandwidth. Yeah. And the second thing is collaboration with teachers, like I mentioned just now. So if you have students with low and high bandwidth, most likely other teachers will have the same situation too. And if you can uh, align yourselves and um, maybe one teacher can do the high bandwidth classes, another one can do low bandwidth classes, sharing resources, I think that's the way to go. Right. 
And if you want to find out, just now you were asking about what uh, com our company is doing, right? If they want to, would like to find out more, you can go to facebook.com slash GSL or to our website, permimpingsl.org to find out more about what our organization is doing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, another one, I think one last two questions that we'll put it up. Uh, true, the most challenging part is in preparing online questions, especially for university students. It is hard to monitor them. At the same time, we need to achieve learning targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I guess we have uh, discussed on this question before, which is that A, number one, uh, do not work alone. Work with teachers to come up with questions, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then maybe something uh, for, for me, my side, right? Info that I actually got uh, to share with all teachers out there. Uh, during the MCO period, we have unprecedentedly saw an emergence of online training materials by teachers all across Malaysia. And not only Malaysia, across the world as well, right? Yes. So um, there are a lot of teachers that are starting to come up with YouTube videos that are teaching uh, students and they are sharing questions as well. So uh, do find out from this. I've re uh, yesterday, I just spoke to someone that is on the project of compiling every single topic that is out there in the wow. primary and secondary school uh, syllabus. So it just started two months ago. So he's starting to compile all of this to compile it uh, systematically for all teachers out there, right? So in a nutshell, uh, do not work alone, right? Yes. Get as many support from other teachers as well to lessen the stress. We know it's a very stressful period for a lot of teachers out there, but the more that you work as a team, uh, the less stressful it gets, right? Definitely. Your comments on this as well. Yeah, I think uh, education needs to be played like a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So a lot of people play like it's table tennis or you play on your own. And then actually it's supposed to be like a football team where we all help each other to make a great learning happen. And I just want to plug uh, another site that I saw, which works very, which is has a lot of content, like you mentioned, they compile a lot of content in one space. Uh, this site is called Check Go Tube. So the spelling is a little bit special. It's C I K G O O, Check Go Tube. And they have, uh, they organize it uh, to primary and high school. And according to different subjects, if you need any resources, is I think these resources are available out there. Just have to search for it. Right. So, yeah. so I guess in the future, right, uh, the job of a teacher. Uh, will get easier and easier because of all of this uh, video uh, materials. You, you may not even have to teach in future. You can just ask the students to watch it and then they come to school and you guide those who are in uh, having challenges understanding the concept. Okay? Yes, yes. I, and I think that would be probably the direction moving forward, uh, which is blended learning. Because yes. now that only from five, I think students will take turns to come to school. A school might not be able to fit every student. So they when they are at home, it's very important that they are learning something too. So blended learning is the way forward, I believe. Right. So uh, on the future of education post MCO, please tune in tomorrow night. We will have a forum session, forum panel discussion discussing among uh, three of our panel uh, uh, speakers that will be talking about the future on education. What's going to happen after MCO? How will our education system and how we perceive education and how we run education, how will it change? after MCO, so a very interesting topic over there. Okay, so right. I guess the one final question before we move on to lunch break. So uh, if we are talking about syllabus, do you agree that we will achieve less on finishing, but not necessarily on learning? So in other words, is less, less is more, more is less. If you force them to go through the syllabus, they might learn less. So what do you, what, what's your take on this? Uh, I I definitely agree on this, actually. I feel that once we have slightly less syllabus, right, the teachers will have more room to do creative things. And then it is when teachers, they are empowered to teach creatively, I think students can learn a lot better. And when the syllabus is lesser, they also have a lot more opportunity to do projects, which would really internalize their learning and I think open their eyes to things that are out of the textbook. Right. Okay. So I guess uh, with that, uh, I guess uh, that is our time for Bernard. Unfortunately, there's so many other questions I think uh, a lot of teachers will be asking. Even after online, uh, after this live session, right, I'm sure more teachers will be coming in for any questions. So if you have any questions for Bernard, as always, we will have a feedback form, especially for Bernard. 
under the unit session. So please click into the link, fill in in the Google form if you have any questions so that we can bring it up to Bernard and the speakers out there so that we may serve uh, all of the teachers out there. Okay, so Bernard, any last words before we uh, sh send you off for lunch break? <laughs> send all of us off for lunch break, right? So uh, I just want to end up by saying to all of all of you respected educators out there who are still trying your best to learn new platforms, teach students, uh, I really, really respect you and I hope that you wouldn't give up despite uh, the stress. I hope that you'll continue teaching because only through all of you, our students can have access to quality education. So yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Okay, thank you so much for the word of encouragement from Bernard and I hope that the hope is high after uh, Bernard's uh, sharing session for today, right? Okay, so thank you once again, Bernard, for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you here. A lot of Thanks. tips I've learned personally for myself as well. And uh, so we would uh, definitely want to see you in the future. All right. So thank you, Bernard. I send you off for lunch break. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay, so there you go. Bernard, our third speaker of the day. I'm sure all of you out there are learning a lot of different techniques that uh, teachers are using on their daily uh, teaching routine during MCO. So this is what we are trying to achieve uh, in this Education Summit 2020, which is to bring in good case studies, good techniques, right, good softwares and good methods that teachers out there are already using. Share it to all of the teachers out there so that we may as a team, right, like a team sport, we may be able to share all the resources out there so that we don't have to fight alone on this battle, right? Okay, so uh, before going out into the lunch break, so uh, a little bit about the next speaker. After this, 2 p.m., we will have Dr. Mano. So Dr. Mano will be uh, sharing on the topic of dyslexia-friendly teaching. So any one of you out there who actually has uh, students which has uh, dyslexia, right? So it's very prevalent. One in 10 students uh, in Malaysia actually has that mild or severe case of dyslexia. So let's find out more about this after the lunch break. And before sending you off, uh, just a final reminder, please do remember to uh, join the Telegram group uh, for Education Summit 2020 uh, because all of the communication will be sending it out in the that Telegram group. And if anything were to happen to this Facebook group, right, if we can't upload it live, we will have a backup link for you so that you do not miss out in any of the sessions that is up for grab later on in the second and the third day. All right, and also do remember, to please also go to the Malaysia Education Summit, which is a public page, right? Like that because the communication will be done through that as well, right? Through that public page and telegram. So please go and like that if you haven't do so. And finally, uh, please remember to uh, key in any of your comments and feedbacks in the feedback form. So, uh, so that all of our speakers, not only Bernard, right? So the sharing questions, we will share it out to all of the speakers out there as well so that they may cater their uh, sharing session to cater um, more, uh, to, to make it more relevant for you out there because all of your questions we will take into consideration because end of the day, we are trying to solve your problem, your questions and your challenges, all right? Okay, so as of right now, let's go for the lunch break and I will see you back at 2 p.m., 2 p.m. sharp. All right, so thank you very much and uh, let's go for lunch.